This is the OMG Book Show with William O'Day, episode number 23. The time is 1943, and the American forces are pushing into Italy, pushing Hitler back on his heels, ready to deal the final blow. Welcome to the OMG Book Show, where it's all about taking you into the brains of fantastic authors. No scalpels required. It's more than an interview, it's, it's an, an experience. experience. And now, your host, William O'Day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show today. What did you think about that interesting intro? It was my version of the World War II newsreels that played in movie theaters. In any case, it was pertinent to today's interview because we are speaking with the best-selling author, Mark Sullivan. And uh, in particular, we're talking about his latest book called Beneath a Scarlet Sky, which is an amazing read. Mark has also co-authored a number of thrillers with the godfather of the thriller genre, James Patterson. And in the interview today, Mark talks with us about uh, kind of how this story began, how this book began. And it is an absolutely wild tale. And if you don't see destiny and stars written all over it, then uh, I don't think you have your eyes open because it uh, it just, it's amazing. He also talks with us about uh, when he first met Pino Lella in Italy uh, several years ago, I think as he mentions 2006 or seven, and just kind of how this guy blew him away and the stories that he had to tell. And the deeper that he spoke with this gentleman, Pino Lella, and the deeper their connection got, the more and more of these stories and memories that uh, of his history and what he had done uh, in the final years of World War II. He also tells us about how the book originally came in at around 900 pages, which is generally far too long for a book that is trying to find a mainstream audience, or really any audience at all, unless you're like Brandon Sanderson's fantasy fans. I think they love like a thousand plus is a good place to start. Uh, no, but he brought it down from 900 to 500 pages or so, and then he talks about uh, some of the scenes and characters or people. When I say characters in this interview, I'm actually talking about people. People because these were real people in real scenarios. So he talks with us about all of that and so much more. It is a fantastic interview and it's a really nice look kind of below the surface of uh, what went on with the book and what went on in Pino Lella's life and what was happening in Italy, Milan in particular, at the time. So without further ado, surgical gloves on, metaphorical scalpel in hand, let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show today. I'm, I'm actually going to do this better than the first time because I got a chance to do it once. And now, just like anything in life, you practice and you get better. So I am super excited and honored to be uh, bringing you today a very special guest with an absolutely amazing book. His name is Mark Sullivan, and he has written, amongst other things, uh, the Beneath a Scarlet Sky book that so many people, including myself, uh, we're just absolutely bowled over. Like, uh, I mean, it was just unbelievably amazing. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It is absolutely our pleasure. So here we are at the beginning of the interview. Let's start off with a softball pitch type question. So at, at what point did you decide you were going to write an emotionally gripping, heart-wrenching mega bestseller? Uh, I actually didn't. I... <laughs> I abs I didn't know who would want to read it. I just know that when I had heard the story, it moved me deeply. And I became convinced that it was one of the best untold stories I'd ever heard. And so I became committed to telling the story in the best way. And luckily and miraculously, people have responded to the story the same way I did. Yeah, it's uh, and we'll we'll go into various topics of it uh, over the course of the interview. Uh, but just from the outset, I want to say, like, it really is, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't heard of it out there already, it is absolutely amazing. And, you know, just looking at Amazon here, I can tell you there are over 16,000 reviews with a 4.8 star average. And uh, honestly, that does, unless you're J.K. Rowling, that does not happen. And it happened with this book. So clearly people it's touching people's lives in a big way. I think so. Um, I get a lot of letters from people. Surprisingly, it was the thing that, that I didn't expect um, from people who were in some sense of deep despair and some of them, frankly, suicidal, who read the book and have written me to say that it changed them, which is just, I mean, unbelievably mind blowing to me. 
So. Yeah, that uh, that impact that you can have on people's lives. Do they in and not? I don't want to obviously get specifics about that because that's kind of a personal moment shared between you and a reader. Uh, in general terms, though, do they are they connecting with uh, obviously Pino, your uh, main character, or not even character person in real life, whose story is based on Pino Lella? Are they? Uh, is it reflective of his heroic kind of journey, or is it also touching on? Because you had some pretty. Uh, turbulent, wild uh, origins for this story as well, right? Yes, and you know the, the answer is is mostly to Pino, but sometimes to both my story and Pino's. Um, you know, I I heard the story on the worst day of my life. Uh, my little brother and best friend had drunk himself to death. I'd written a book that tanked in the states and. I was involved in this long, lingering business dispute that had taken me to the right to the edge of personal bankruptcy. And I uh, realized driving on a snowy Montana highway one February afternoon in 2006, I realized I was worth more dead than alive. And I considered driving into a bridge abutment so my family could collect on the insurance. Wow. Um, I didn't do it, but um, I pulled over in a Costco parking lot as rattled as I've ever been in my life. And I basically begged God, the universe, whatever you want to call it. And I asked for a story. And um, three hours later, <clears throat> my wife forces me to go to a dinner party that I have no interest in attending. She's got a stomach flu. And I said, I'm not going. She said, you have to. We've canceled on three times. She goes, go for an hour, and then you can just excuse yourself. And so I go to this dinner party, and a perfect stranger starts telling me the story of Pino Lella. Yeah, that's amazing. And does your wife ever bring up how she forced you to go to this party and subsequently what happened, like when you're having an argument about something totally unrelated? What I mean is that she was uh, part of an oracular experience. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she's um, like, hey, honey, take out the garbage. Yeah. Come on, remember when I made you go to that yeah, dinner party? Yeah. I point you in the right direction. Well, she usually does. That's in general. That's true. Well, that is a good woman to have on your side, no doubt. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to ask you about, I watched a presentation you did at the, I think it's the Wagner College Holocaust Center. Right. And uh, I'll put it in the for fans out there. I'm going to put that link in the show notes because it's really fascinating. Uh, it kind of builds out the background of what was happening in the world at that time. But one thing that uh, I thought was kind of humorous that you mentioned about it is this guy, Pino Lella, seemed kind of like the Forrest Gump of those times. Like he was like in the thick of many major events occurring. How did that, I mean, is it is it just like uh, the stars and destiny at work there? You know, I don't know, because that is literally the first response I had as I began to listen to him tell the story, you know, back in February, in April of 2006. Um it just seemed as that he was either the, at the thick of it or sort of just off the edge of it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, as an observer or what have you. And you got to know the guy. He's he's just one of the genuinely nicest people you will ever encounter. And at first I was like, this guy's pulling my leg, right? And then all of a sudden he would take me somewhere in Milan and he would start showing me and we would find stuff that supported what he was talking about. And, you know, it, it was like he it either all happened to him or he's got the most miraculous imagination I've ever encountered, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, I just, it, it, there were just these things that he would say. Like, I'll give you an example. So, um Way, way back the, at the beginning of all this, in that first time period, when I would ask him about this Nazi general who he drove for, and he would always say, well, you know, he ran the organization Tout and, in Italy, and I would say, well, okay, so, so he reported to Albert Speer, and he would say, no, 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 maybe sometimes, but he goes, he reported to Adolf Hitler, and I thought that he was just, you know, yanking my chain. And so fast forward 10 years and I'm I've tracked down this Nazi general's daughter on her deathbed and I'm interviewing her and this general's minister and his former aide. And I just say to him exactly what I'd said to Pino 10 years before. So, you know, he was the head of the organization Tote in Italy and he reported to Albert Speer. 
And the minister and the aide, the, the, the daughter was too sick to talk much, but the minister and the aide, they start shaking their head and they go, no, no, he reported to Adolf Hitler. And I just couldn't believe it. Wow. You know? um, and there was stuff like that all the time. And um, many of them didn't take 10 years to corroborate. You know, many of them was apparent within that first three weeks that I spent with him that I was on to a story that, you know, had dimensions that I'd never considered before as a writer. Yeah. And it feels like, um, I mean, and not just his life, but even kind of your interception of it and coming to it as the writer, there's just like destiny and fate and the stars written all over both aspects to it. Because looking at your bio, I mean, aside from just this chance encounter at the dinner party, but it seems uh, you have a, uh, a long history experience with investigative reporting. Is that right? Yeah, reporting. I did that um, for about 10 years after I got out of grad school. And uh, and then even when I was transitioning into being a full time novelist, I wrote a lot of magazine stuff, long form investigative magazine articles. Um, it's really helped me in my ability to research and to know when I'm being told a whole story and when somebody's holding back on me. Um, and that's just, it's a, it's a, a great skill to have gotten under my belt before I started writing novels. Right. And then uh, I think I'd saw in the interview, you'd mentioned kind of, uh, using some of those skills to, cause you had to tease out, uh, details out of Pino about various aspects. Like he would either, you know, gloss over them, uh, thinking they were no big deal or things like that. Yeah. I mean, he's a very self-deprecating person. And he does tend to gloss over things at first glance. And I learned, you know, certain mannerisms that he had, you know, way of flicking his finger in the air or whatever that he was he was holding back. And so what I would always do is I would try to circle back through stories and I would say, you know, this one doesn't sound quite right. Is Can you remember more? And, you know, gradually then all of a sudden you know, the deeper stories coming out and, and the more disturbing stories coming out. Wow. I think I had read the, you started this kind of uh, expedition with three weeks uh, with him in Italy. Is that right? Yeah. The first time I went over, uh, he picked me up at the airport in this little old Citroen and, you know, I get in it where, and he's a big guy, you know, and he's crunched over underneath this this tiny car and we take off and he gets out on like the autobahn or, you know, the, a, the big highway and he starts driving like a race car driver. And I mean, I'd never, I'd never been in a car who was someone that brilliant at the wheel. And it was very, he wasn't doing it to impress me. It was just the way he drove. Right. It was like yeah. a, one of those, another subtle signal of the veracity of his claims. Well, certainly, you know, because if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, like some of these descriptions of, you know, like the last days of the war when he was driving through basic war zones, um, to to know that he had been taught by a guy who ended up being the the Grand Prix world champion, and then to have my own experience in cars with him <laughs> um, when he still drove, you know, it was just it, it was dumbfounding. But first of all, I didn't know people could drive like that, you know. Um, certainly not in traffic. <laughs> right. <laughs> you were kind of hoping people didn't drive like that. Or was it more exciting or terrifying? Uh, when it, it was, it was exciting the first time it was terrifying when we were going up the mountain to Casa Alpina. Wow. It was terrifying. And uh, is Casa, there are a lot of, uh, names, you know, that are uh, unfamiliar at first glance. So I'm trying to place all of them. Casa yeah. Alpina, is that the, uh, boys boarding school up in the Alps? Yeah, that, it, it no longer is. It's a hotel, but yes, uh, during the war, what happened is that, um, so Pinolella is 17 when this story opens and he's this carefree kid. I mean, he's obsessed with what most 17 year olds are obsessed with food and music and girls. And, um, but, and he's basically, he, he ignores the war. I mean, he listens to it. He knows it's going on, but it's just not central on his radar. Right. And then the bombardment of Milan starts and there. The reason that the Allies are bombing Milan is because they've all but destroyed the Ruhr Valley where 
Adolf Hitler had his industrial base. And they know that Hitler only has one other choice, which is to go south to Italy, to Genoa, Turin, Milan, these big industrial areas, because that's where the machine tools are, right, to build everything from parts for tanks to cannons to the war, you know, okay. to, to build the war effort. And what happens is that the, that the Nazis eventually invade Italy um, and they rescue Mussolini and put him in power as this bombardment's going on. And the Nazis, being the Nazis, soon in the September of 1943, they start hunting um, Italy's Jews. And overnight, this organization springs up that's designed an underground railroad that's designed to get Jews out of Italy through the northern passes into Switzerland. And one of them is through this Catholic boys school uh, in the Alps, high above uh, Campo del Cino, and it's off the north end of Lake Como. Um, And Pinolella gets sent there in late September of 1943 to get out of the bombardment. His house has been, and and his parents' purse store has been destroyed in the bombardment, and his parents are afraid for his life, and they send him to the mountains. Well, he gets up there, and all of a sudden he becomes part of the mission to rescue Italy's Jews. Wow. And uh, there is a lot of, uh, and I think in the discussion on YouTube that I saw, you'd mentioned that there were 20 or more uh sojourns over the mountains that they had taken and you compress those into a two or three but uh just in the ones in the book that we have seen uh man it's just the i haven't personally been to the swiss alps yet i know what uh being around high mountains are but just harrowing harrowing sort of descriptions about people with no other than pino you know and uh but the people that he's taking over zero experience up there and having to go over uh was it all the time at night or, or just as things got worse? No, they started, they would start at night all the time, you know, very, very early in the morning. They wanted to be way up the side of the mountain before uh, dawn. And that was just because they could cover terrain um, under the cloak of darkness. Right. You know, and then they were further up the mountain. They're un- less likely to be spotted from below. Um, there were all sorts of reasons that they did it. And did, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, Pino survived these adventures. Uh, did he successfully navigate like every single group of people that he, no, no, he, he, he was, he was the first guide out of there. Uh, and then he ended up teaching as more and more people, because it wasn't just Jews who were going through there. There would be like downed pilots and political refugees, that the uh, fascists or the Nazis were hunting and it, there were more and more people needing to go over. And so Pino ends up teaching his brother Mimo and then several of the other boys. And when he leaves in the spring of 44, that effort continues virtually to the end of the war. Wow. And you mean uh, that's the point where he returns to Milan. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so that, uh, um, if you haven't read the book yet, ladies and gentlemen, there may or may not be spoilers, uh, in this interview. So just be aware if, and in fact, if something big comes up, I'll try to preface it with that. Uh, because you trust me, you want to, you want to, uh, get this story, uh, straight from the book firsthand. It's totally amazing. But I wanted to ask, uh, that is the point at which he, returns to Milan, I think, and in the book mentions he, his parents or maybe aunt and uncle to uh, talk him into joining the Nazis, correct? Yeah. So what happens is they come back in and the his parents are petrified because he's about to turn 18. And young men, uh, they're afraid that they're going to be stuck out there by the Germans as cannon fodder, either to the south where the allies are, are trying to advance north or in Germany, or, you know, the worst case scenario sent to the Russian front where the attrition rate is ridiculous, right? They're, the Russians are squeezing, everybody's squeezing at this point. And they come up with this idea, and it, it was actually something that the Germans promoted in Italy and in other places where they recruited people to join this quasi-military organization called the Organization Tote. 
And they were a combination of like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Quartermaster's Corps. They were in charge of war production, anything to do with the war, from uniforms to boots to, you know, guns to what have you. They, it all came through this organization. And they would also do things like they would guard installations like train stations and air, air bases and stuff like that. But it was all based on supply lines. And they, they, they were recruiting people to join the organization tote. And it was basically touted as a way to avoid combat. Right. Because all you were doing was loading stuff and, you know, you were working in the effort, but you weren't exactly fighting. Right. Right. That was the theory. And his parents thought, you know, that the allies are coming north. They they won't be, you know, another four months at the most. You know, you hear they're coming. Toss the toss the uniform. You know, you're an Italian kid. Right. That'll be it. And so, but he's adamantly opposed to it, but his mother forces him to do it because uh, he's not yet 18. And so, bang, he goes in and he's, you know, he's marching up and down in this uh, boot camp. And then by the time it gets to be late July of 1944, he gets put in a, um, a train station to guard it. And the train station gets bombed. And he gets like hurled through the air, his concussion, he almost loses his right index finger, wakes up in a hospital, um, they've sewn it back on. He spends another, you know, ten days there because of the concussion. They send him home for ten days rest. So he goes home and it's there when he comes to his uncle's leather goods store that there's a um, a German staff car there sitting there with the hood up. And this guy tinkering and can't get the car to start. And Pino knows a lot about cars because, you know, he was trained by this guy who is the world who would become the world Grand Prix champion, Alberto Ascari. And they, he gets under the hood and fixes it, fires the car up and lowers the hood. And there's this German general standing there, Major General Hans Leiers. Uh, and he was an um, extraordinarily powerful man arguably the second most powerful German in Italy. And he sees that Pino understands cars, and he's also a member of the organization Tote. And this general runs the organization Tote. Uh, and Pino becomes his driver. And so inadvertently, he becomes a spy inside the German high command because he goes where the general goes, and he sees what the general sees. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. It's uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, man, it's, I, I'm about to say one of the things that struck me about the book, but then, uh, you know, you could, I could say that probably about a thousand times. I think uh, like everybody else out there. Uh, but a couple of the scenes that uh, really just, I mean, they're like, you know, on the one side, kind of, I've got two different scenes in mind here. And the one side is like a gut punch that just hopeless sadness. And then on the other side is, uh, the complete opposite. And I'll just describe them to you. I'd love to get your kind of perspectives on them. Uh, one is where they, uh, he's taking a group of people over and, uh, they find a little safe, uh, kind of hut, uh, temporary shelter up in the mountains and, uh, avalanche comes and just completely buries them between, I don't know, dozens of feet of snow. I think it was, and just the the way you capture the sense of uh, foreboding, I don't know, like a hopelessness, despair. I mean, it was crushing to read. Yeah. Is that a was that an event that uh, Pino described to you? Yeah, the, he got avalanched into that into a, a hut up there with his brother and, and a couple of people, and they had to dig their way out. Now it's all part of these two big, as I said, you know, I compressed events in the story so that people would understand the dramatic scope of what he endured. Right. Um, and yeah, they had to dig their way out at an angle. I don't know if it was that deep. It had certainly covered, um, the hut and covered the roof of the hut, which made, you know, oxygen an issue. How are they going to get air? And then they had to dig their way out at an angle. Um, but they did it. And, uh, you know, it's typical, Pino. You know, he was like, well, it wasn't that big. You know, it took us a while, but you know, once we had air, we knew we were going to get out eventually. You know, but he, he's just like that. I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, the one time when a grenade went off in one of those huts um, that somebody had put in there as a booby trap trying to discourage him from taking Jews out. Wow. Uh, and, you know, he describes 
just having just happening to be outside of it outside the hut when it was heating up the stove you wow. know if he'd been in it he would have been killed yeah that's just yeah yeah it's when folks end up reading that or if they already have you'll you'll know what i mean about that and uh but the the, the book is not i mean clearly overall the book is not about just kind of the the sadness and the tragedy of what was happening, uh, there are, are triumphs as well. One of the scenes that I absolutely love, which is on the kind of opposite side of that spectrum, is uh, one of the ladies, I, f- I think it's uh, Mrs. Napolitano. Yes. And I think she's pregnant and she's kind of yes. having some troubles. Obviously, I mean, anybody going over these mountains and especially in her condition. But they yes. finally get there. Pino's got her on her back and just on his back. she's on his back she's on his back yeah and th- yeah. they just zip down across this field and uh no ski poles no <laughs> no sense of uh they might totally wipe out or at least they got through it and just the way you communicated the the exhilaration of freedom was i mean i i'm not a huge crier from reading books but man my 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 tear you know i got eyes got misty and it was just so beautiful it was was that also uh, amongst the stories that you heard from him? He skied her out on his back. I mean, who does that? This guy, what? I mean, you can say he's larger than life. Uh, that's. Yeah, you, know, you know, the thing is, there's p- people who are like, oh, no one could do that. I and, mean, you know, my, I have a kid who at 17 or 18 could have done it. But my own son could have done it. So I know that it can be done. And yeah. to me, Pinolella, I mean, you know, when I meet him at 70, 80, he's this big, robust man. And, you know, who'd spent huge amounts of his life climbing around in the mountains or skiing around in them, right? So he's a big, strong dude. And I think people lose track that there are people out there who can do these kinds of things that are strong as oxes, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, So that story was, that scene was one of my favorite scenes to write. Um, The second I heard it, uh, I knew it was going to be one of the best scenes in the book. Um, and I'm glad it worked. You know, I'm glad people responded in the way I did too. Yeah. You, uh, you totally get, uh, you know, as, as writers and you hope readers do. And I did, and, uh, you know, just, I am basically, I'm maybe I'm on his, Pino's other shoulder right next to Miss Napolitano as we fly down there. And, uh, you know, finally freedom is steps away where it seemed like it just wasn't going to happen time and time again before that. Right. Right. And that's exactly, you know, what I wanted to convey was that there was this last risk and then they were there and, you know, uh, everything she had gone through to that point sort of fell away from her and she starts laughing, you know, and it's, she's laughing with joy. Yeah. Just beautiful. You absolutely nailed it, at least in my opinion. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, obviously General Liars is a, a complicated figure and, uh, uh, a bad guy, you know, in simple terms. And then also uh, another Nazi that was down there at the time, Colonel Ralph, I believe his name is. Yes, Walter Ralph. Walter Ralph. Uh, well, I noticed that obviously they do, you know, you're you're aware that they are doing horrible things uh, at the time. But you also include at least a few scenes, if not more, where you kind of see both of these guys as uh, human beings, you know, not just like black endless soul crushing monsters uh right. like ralph when he's helping them uh herd the oxen and right. uh layers after they get strafed by the british fighter and they're just talking about his past and stuff yes. is were you trying to paint the the kind of the grays in there on purpose or as a byproduct of just telling stories no, well i mean it was as at least as far as general layers i mean it, the guy, the guy is aptly named, you know, uh, he had layers to him and Pino even to this day is conflicted about what he really believes about the guy. You know, he, he, the man's still a mystery to him. Um, in one sense, he thinks that deep down that layers was a decent person. Um, and and yet I'll point out other aspects of his personality and he'll nod about that. And, and then he'll, you know, he'll cite another instance where, you know, layers was, was 
way, way more than a monster that layers, you know, had shown kindness had had done, you know, multiple things in this area. So to me, the great challenge was how am I going to convey the three dimensionality of this guy? And the only way to do it is to present it that people who are involved in heinous things, I think what makes them even worse is that they're human. They're not monsters. Right. Right. They're human. And as difficult as it is, even 70 years later for Pino to, to wrestle with who layers was and what his ultimate, you know, depiction should be. Um, it, that was, that was exactly the kind of confusion I wanted the reader to have. Same thing with Ralph. Ralph was responsible for killing all these people. Right. And, and yet even after the war, you know, when he managed to escape and stuff, he was always known as this charming individual who had murdered people. Is that part of what makes it scarier to look at uh, as an outsider is that you can connect to them because you're connecting them th- through their more you know normal, rational human characteristics, but then uh, you, that connection is made and then you're experiencing this just horrible, horrible, heinous, like you're saying, side of them. And mm-hmm. it just twists you up inside. Right. It, it's, it's, it's conflict. There's all this conflict. You can't, it's hard to rationalize or understand somebody who's got multiple facets to their personality and some of them quite dark. You got to wrestle with it. You know, I did. And, and Pino continues to. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, and here's a spoiler alert out there, everybody. So if you haven't read it, just fast forward 60 seconds or so. Uh, one thing uh, that I was not confused about, but wondering about more is, why did at the end, uh, when Pino has every chance to exact revenge on this guy who has done so so many horrible deeds, does he choose not to? What's what happened there? Well, a number of things happened there. There was a a shift in blame, right? That takes place in that conversation when he has the opportunity to kill Lairs. And I also think it shows deep down who the human was. Okay. Really. I think deep down, I don't think Pinoel is capable of hurting anyone. Right. That's just not uh, in his nature. No. He's a helper. He's a pleaser. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense like that. Thank you for that uh, explanation. And now hopefully we can have uh, folks rejoin us here who uh, the spoiler is alert uh, is over. Sorry, if you uh, are joining us again. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is that uh, in the preface, uh, you talk about uh, sharing Pino's grief. Maybe it was during this three week trip in 2006 Mm -hmm. um, and just how much that put your own life and your own uh, problems into perspective. Can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah. You know, I, as I said, I came to the story from a troubled place, um, a deeply troubled place, the worst place I've ever gotten to mentally and emotionally in my life. And going to Italy and hearing Pino tell me this sprawling epic story, heart wrenching, you know, triumphant, all of a sudden my own issues seem to pale in comparison, you know, and his insight into grief and tragedy and how you survive it and go on basically taught me a lot about life in general. And it was that experience that in the long run, at the end of that three weeks, when I left Italy, I was a different person. And I continue to be that different different person. And when I left Italy, I vowed to tell the story to as many people as I could. Yeah. And I just didn't think it was going to take 10 years, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the best stories take a while, I guess, right? I guess, yeah. Yeah. There are certain books that are year, there are certain books that are two, and there's some books that are 10. They just, you know, they come out when they come out. Yeah. Do you have any, are there other uh, 10 year projects uh, on the boil in in your life right now? I'm hoping not. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That was, that's a lot to commit to, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I, I wrote numerous other books during those times where I was researching Pinot. It was my passion project. And I'm lucky now that, you know, I can work on passion projects as my main projects. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, I had, I'd read somewhere where you had mentioned, maybe it was that interview, uh, but you had mentioned that the book originally was coming in uh, more around like 900 pages. Yeah, yeah, 850, 900, depending on when I was printing it. Wow. And then you trimmed it down to somewhere around 500. Uh, yeah. What were, uh, what was one of the like hardest scenes or arcs or characters that you had to cut to make that happen? Yeah, I think probably the hardest thing was um, Father Barbareski. So Barbareski, um, it, for those of you who haven't read the book, he's a seminarian as the book opens. And he has this unusual relationship with the uh, Cardinal of Milan. And um, anyway, he ends up in Casal Pina early on before Pino gets there. And he is the one who leads the very first escape. They bring out a bunch of the boys who are there already and they go on this long picnic hike. And I can't remember what the numbers were 30 went out and 27 came back. And the three, three Jews just disappeared into those woods where Mrs. Napolitano disappeared into. Okay. But what happened is he comes back and he and father Ray realized that this is a, that this is going to become more of an issue, right? As, as the Germans invade and, they they are the ones who invent this idea of um, an underground railroad. And so Barbareski goes back into uh, Milan and he sets up this big forging operation and he allies himself, you know, not only with Father Ray, but this organization called the Aguil Rondages. It means like the wandering eagles. It was the equivalent of the Italian Boy Scouts. And they were actually banned in the last 10 years of Mussolini. Um, but they met in secret. And the boys in the Boy Scout troop were, you know, they were the ones who peddled all over Milan delivering papers. And then in another escape route um, to the, uh, more to the east, northeast of Lake Como, um, there was a big escape route up through there. And they they moved, you know, Jews over that uh, pass into Switzerland as well. So that was fascinating stuff, but it wasn't Pino Lella's story. You know what I'm saying? So right. it was one of those things where, God, this is an this is an amazing part of it. So the people would grasp it. But it, it just had to like a lot of things that I didn't like. It had to hit the editing room floor. Right. And it feels like, um, and uh, I'd love to know if this is uh, true, but uh, his younger brother, Mimo, uh, it seems like there's a uh, book's worth of stories to tell there as well. Yeah? Oh, right. I mean, the kid was ferocious. That's how people described him in battle. Uh, he was 15, 16 years old when he gets in, when he joins the partisan resistance. And he ultimately, you know, faces down an entire you know, company of German soldiers and takes them prisoners like single handed. And he's, you know, gets all these commendations and everything. And the, the, the crazy thing is, is he was never very tall and all he wanted to be was tall, right? He <laughs> wanted to be big. He didn't understand that his personality and his courage made him bigger than most men, six, five. And did you, you could tell, um, you know, especially in the beginning when they're just having their normal lives together and even uh, uh, continuing on as the story uh, develops, but they have like a close, you know, sort of taking care of each other, looking out for each other kind of relationship, the two brothers. Oh yeah. They loved each other for sure. Did you was, you know, and you're talking about the tragic uh, passing of your own brother, where was there elements in there that reflected back on your own life or was that just telling Pino's version of the story? No, for sure. I mean, I, I had a brother who was two years younger than me, you know, the exact difference. Um, it was not lost on me and his, you know, his love of his brother. And in fact, you know, he ends up losing his brother roughly around the age that I did. Wow. Uh, and so we were able to, you know, Pino and I connected first through skiing, talking about it, racing, all these interests that we shared in common. And then it gradually just kept getting deeper and deeper. You know, and when I realized that Mimo had died, you know, when he was, I think, 44 and my brother died when he was 44, it was like, you know, this is 
There's more parallels here than I can point to. Yeah. It it definitely feel you know, from the outsider's perspective. So I'm I'm sure from your point of view, just the uh the the idea that there was more than just chance happening couldn't have been clearer. Yeah. Yeah. This I don't know how I you know, I, I'm a trained investigative reporter. I'm by nature and by training skeptical. But I you know, I don't know I can't begin to describe the number of times when I would hit a a blank wall and I had no chance of finding my way forward in the research and out of the blue, some person would just appear, you know, and, and direct me in the right direction. Wow. Have you, since writing the book and you're talking about getting letters from people having read it and knowing about it, have, has anyone written in, uh, with kind of more details about themselves or their families involved in, in oh, lots, 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 lots. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hear a lot of stories and they're all beautiful, you know, about my grandfather fought in Italy. He never talked about it. I'm beginning to understand why to my father, um, escaped Italy over the Alps, just like Pino did, um, I don't know if he went through there, but he described priests helping him. And, you know, so it's you get these letters uh, out of the. I got one, a a string of letters from these two or three brothers who actually knew Father Ray and spent time in the boys camp. But after the war. Oh, wow. And, you know, they were they were describing Father Ray exactly the way Pino did. You know, just if they felt like going and climbing up a cliff, he'd go, sure, go ahead. Here's a couple of apples and some cheese. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, he'd, he'd seen enough danger to uh, kind of uh, conceptualize it uh, in a different way than most people would. Yeah, well, he'd been there, right? He, he, he relived a lot of his childhood reading the book, he said. So that was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, that is very cool. Uh, well, I wanted to ask, uh, we had kind of mentioning, uh, this is uh, turning from the book a little bit and back into your life uh, mm-hmm. and the preparation you had as an investigative reporter. I thought it sounded very cool just in a couple of instances that I had read about. Uh, you mentioned something along the lines of you broke a story that almost brought the uh, broker uh, mortgage brokerage industry to its uh, knees in the United States. Is that right? That was way, way back in about... Maybe 30 years ago, I was working in Washington, D.C., and there was a an actual mortgage insurance company is what it was. And long story short, I got lucky and found some insiders within this company, Tycor, and they were able to show me the unequivocal proof that it was a Ponzi scheme. Wow. And did, did anyone go actually... Uh serve time for these yeah. uh yeah but i mean i can't claim to that they were there were all sorts of people after these guys by the time i got involved what i got was the actual documentation of who the people were who were uh invested in the ponzi scheme and uh most all of them innocent they had no idea what was going on and then we were able to show that the uh the mechanism by its nature was a ponzi scheme Wow. Well, that's great to hear. It's great to hear that people uh, actually were served justice to some degree, because it seems like so often, you know, in in grand scope corporate activities like that, it's more usually just uh, a fine is paid along with a disclaimer about any guilt. No, the company was evaporated. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, And then even going further back uh, into your your life and history— I had read uh, something very cool that you, right out of, I think it was university, went to uh, serve in the Peace Corps in Niger, West Africa. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, you had uh, you worked with the, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but the Tuareg people helping teach English. Is that right? Yes, I worked um, with the Tuareg, uh, Hausa, and Fulani people. I lived... Uh, in a place called Agadez, which was a major stop on the ancient caravan route between Tripoli and Timbuktu, um, these were regional uh, high schools that I that I worked in, and um, so these kids would come in out of the desert and go to school uh, as if they were going to a boarding school. Wow! And, uh, it was fascinating. Now, those things that'll change your life. You know, all of a sudden you go from living outside of 
Boston in a suburban bedroom community and go to this good school that is largely sheltered, a small place, and then bang, I'm in the middle of Africa. Yeah, that's a transition. What prompted you? Because I mean, most people don't make that decision. They don't say like, I'm going to go get uncomfortable and see this other aspect. What what pushed you there? Um, Well, you know, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't have anything to write about. As I said, you know, I I led a fairly mundane childhood and um, and went to college, great school, loved it. Uh, But, you know, insular, 1600 kids. And I knew I wanted to write, but I didn't ha- I didn't think I had anything to say. So I set out to have an adventure, basically. And I, I, t- I pursued it in two routes. One was Navy flight, uh, being a pilot for the Navy. And the other one was the Peace Corps. And I got offers to do both. And so I went to my father and I said, you know, what do you think? And he thought about it and he said, I think you should go in the Peace Corps, which really surprised me, you know, because I thought my father would for sure tell me to go in the Navy. And I said, why is that? And he said, you have a severe problem with authority. You'll end up in Leavenworth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's uh, at least he was talking straight talk to you. <laughs> that's right. Was your uh, was your father in the military? Why did you think he would try to push you there? So no, my father was 4F. My father is profoundly hard of hearing. Um, but he's just by nature a conservative guy. And I think he thought that I would, you know, be served by going further, by learning, you know, what's essentially a, a super high tech trade of being a pilot. Right. Uh, well, you, you, it sounds like you've clearly over the years, uh, you know, uh, kind of sowed the experiential aspects of life that you can then reap later in writing. Uh, I was reading some of your pastimes you enjoy doing are, uh, as you mentioned already, being an avid skier and uh, a martial artist. What uh, what what art do you practice? Um, Aikido, which is the Japanese art of self defense. Wow. Okay. And then, uh, what have what level have you uh, attained thus far? Uh, fourth degree black belt in that. Whoa! You sound like a potentially dangerous person. <laughs> no. They're actually a teddy bear. <laughs> okay. Just uh, humor me with this hypothetical situation here. So, uh, and I also read, to top it off here, you're really into CrossFit. Is that right? Um, yeah. I have my own CrossFit gym here in my house. Oh, put it together. Cool. I trained in a regular place for about six years until I figured I, I knew enough to do it myself. But yeah, I believe in it. It's good stuff. What's your uh, favorite CrossFit, uh, uh, what's the, what do they call it, routine? Oh, God. Um, maybe I'll give you the one I dread. The- <laughs> Fran is the worst, I think, that I've ever done. Um, but they're all, you know, they're all good. The, the, the nice thing about it is if you're, if you're programming it well, every day is sort of a surprise and a little bit of a shock to your system. Okay. So uh, I think we, can, we as listeners here can assume that you're in good shape. You've got uh, some, some solid defense skills. So now for the hypothetical. Let's say... If Bruce Lee was alive today, would you be able to take him? And, and remember, he would be like 80 years old now. Not, not the Bruce Lee of 30 years. No. He's that good? No. The guy, the guy was brilliant. And unfortunately, this was where the internet, that series of tubes that connects people throughout the universe, or world at least, and perhaps universe later, uh, it cut out on us. I think we unfortunately got connected through a relatively rusty tube. And so you may have heard actually at a couple different points in the show that it dropped out a little bit here and there. But it was at this point that it completely dropped out. And unfortunately, Mark and I were not able to reconnect to finish off the interview. Um, but we were very close to the end. We just had probably three, four, five minutes left. But we did have something left that we would never want to skip on this show. Welcome to the Rorschach Round, where we use ambiguously odd questions to delve deeper into the minds of these amazing authors. Let's get started. And as promised, for the first time ever on this show, I, your host, will be answering the Rorschach questions for the author, because as I've already said, Mark wasn't available to do it. And so just because I felt like it would be a disappointment to not have the Rorschach round at all, I decided I would go ahead and ask my imagination version of Mark, the Rorschach round questions, and then that imagination version of Mark would answer them however he believes they would be correctly answered by the real Mark. So... Uh, without further ado, 
Let's continue. Question number one. If you were to write an autobiography, what would it be titled? Well, I think if I were to do that, it would be called The Day That I Decided to Write a Massive Bestseller That Both Makes People Cry and Feel Good in Their Hearts Because the World is a Good Place in the End. I know it's a long title, but I think it would work. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Uh, Question number two. Black Diamond or Black Mamba? Oh, well, this is an easy one because uh, I love skiing, so Black Diamond. Wonderful. And question number three, Pinot Lella or Pinot Noir? Oh, well, this is a tough one. I uh, enjoyed my time in Italy with Pinot Lella, and we did enjoy the occasional glass of delicious Italian wine. However, upon further review, I would have to say Pinot Lella, 100%. All right, very cool. And for the final question of the Rorschach round, Pinot Gump or Forest Lella? Well, now you're just talking crazy. That doesn't make any sense at all. And, uh, well, I'm just going to go with Pinot Lella again because uh, your your questions don't make any sense. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, my imagination version of Mark, for humoring the audience with that uh, Rorschach round. That was a lot of fun. And uh, Mark, if you ever end up listening to this, I am very sorry that that had to happen that way. I I hope I delivered the answers as you more or less may have answered them. I tried. That's all I can say. I tried. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show today as much as I did, even that last part, the Rorschach round. That was a lot of fun. Special thank you to Mark for taking time out of his schedule to join us and even deal with a, an occasionally rusty internet tube. Uh, we, we both got through it and it worked out great. Mark, thank you so much. That was an amazing interview. And if you would like to find out more about the links not mentioned, uh, because we didn't get to that part of the show, but I will have them in the show notes and they will be links to the book and also to his website and Facebook page and just the usual uh, methods of connection in the modern day and age. So you can find those in the usual place at www.williamoday.com forward slash the number of the episode, which is 23. That's it for today. If you would like to be sure to never miss a show and always have them immediately available on your device of choice, you can subscribe by going to www.williamoday.com forward slash iTunes. And if you enjoyed the show, I would so appreciate a rating and review on iTunes. They both help with store visibility and they also let other listeners know if it's th- if this show is something that they might be interested in checking out. And I've made it easy to access both of those by going to the same link on my my website, www.williamoday.com forward slash iTunes. That will have a link uh, there that you can jump over to either subscribe and or, or maybe all three, uh, rate and review the show. So I would so appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's it for now. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the OMG Book Show. You can find out more at www.williamoday.com.